What's the good news about this? Is there good news? You can check your answer. That's the good news. You can always check your answer. As long as you can take a derivative. But if you can't take a derivative, you shouldn't be trying to take antiderivatives, right? So look, can I check it real quick? Uh, negative 1 pops out. That's 4x to the negative 2. That works. Okay. Here, negative 3 is a constant. Comes along for the ride. Derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. That's this, isn't it? Okay, here, let's take our time here. Negative 3 halves comes out, hits a negative. It should be positive. The 3's cancel. I get 14 over 2, which is 7. So I should have a positive 7. Good. And then I subtract 1 from this. If I subtract 1 from that, I get negative 5 halves. And derivative of a constant is 0. So that's it. It works. OK? Yes. <laughs> well, was there a purpose for the was there a purpose for the derivative? Yes. 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 I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you a really cool example in a second if if we can get to it. How about this one? Mm. What's the antiderivative of this? Find the antiderivative of that. That's uh, one of the inverse functions. Which one? Go ahead. Look it up. Arc sine. Capital F of x. Is that arc sine? Yes. So you're looking off your table, right? Or off your formulas? Yeah. Okay. So this is arc sine of x. How, how would you know that? You would have to recognize it, right? You would have to recognize that as something you did, be familiar with it so you could recover where it came from, right? Another one that we could do, capital F of x, I mean, sorry, little f. How about this one? This is another one that might look familiar to you. 4 over 1 plus x squared. Good. Tangent. Arc tangent or tangent? Derivative regular tangent is secant squared. You were on the right track. What about the 4 though? The 4 is not in there. 4 is a constant. This is the same as 4 times 1 over 1 plus x squared, isn't it? That's the same thing. 4 is a constant, comes along for the ride, antiderivative, it's going to go, the 4 is going to be there, and then the antiderivative 1 over 1 plus x squared was one of the ones I told you you need to remember. Like that's one of the big ones for Cal 2. For those of you going on, you need to recognize that as being the, the antiderivative of this is tangent, inverse. <clears throat> All right. I still, have, I still have a lot of time. This is good. All right. Let's see if you remember this thing. Do you remember that if you had time and distance, so you had some function, let's say s is some function of t. s is some, and let's not use s. Let's just use Let's just use d of t. This right here, d of t. That that's your position. Your position function. Do you all remember what the first derivative gave you? If you had a position? The velocity function. So if you take the derivative of this, <coughs> you get velocity. So I could graph time and the derivative and whatever that graph was, would represent your velocity function. The second was the acceleration. That's right. And if I do it again, acceleration, right, would be the second derivative. Okay. D double prime of T 
would give you acceleration, that would be this graph, right? Understand? Remember? Okay. <clears throat> On Earth, if you drop an object, right? What's the only force acting on it once you release it? Gravity. gravity. And gravity is an acceleration, Minus right? Air. Yeah, take the, we'll forget the air for now, right? So would everyone agree that on Earth, the acceleration of gravity is constant? That's something you learn in physics, but it's the only force acting on something when you drop it. So let's start working backwards then. If I know that on Earth, I can measure the acceleration of gravity. Acceleration versus time is constant. Does anyone know what the acceleration of gravity is? Actually, it's negative. I should have it down here. Negative what? Negative 9.8 meters per second per second. Convert that to feet per second. Can anyone convert that? I'm going to go on my phone and do it. What is 9.8 meters per second? Two feet. Thirty-two point one five two. So negative. This is the graph of it. Negative thirty-two. I'll just say negative thirty-two. Close enough. Negative thirty-two. So if I graphed acceleration <coughs> on Earth, <coughs> if I graphed acceleration on Earth, this is what it would be, right? Can you tell me then what the velocity function would be? So I'm saying that the acceleration function is negative 32, that's it, right? Constant. Yeah? Then what would the velocity be? It would be the antiderivative of this, wouldn't it? Be the antiderivative of this? So the velocity function would be v of t would be the antiderivative of a constant. Careful. Not the derivative of a constant. The antiderivative of a constant. So it would be negative 32. Negative 32 t. t plus, plus c. c. Plus c. Negative 32 t plus c. Is everyone comfortable with that? The idea here is that if you take derivative of this, you're going to get negative 32, right? So going backwards, if you take the antiderivative of a constant, it's just the constant times the variable. In this case, the variable is t. Now, you see that c right there? That c is actually very special. I want you to consider something for a second. If I asked you right now what v of 0 was, what would it be? It would be c. So wouldn't v of 0 represent the velocity at the initial time? Yes? This c is actually your initial velocity. We have a special letter we like to use for that. V0, V0. So that means my velocity function really looks like this. V of t equals negative 32t plus V0. See, the c that we have here will always be the starting velocity of your, of your object. All right, what's the position of this object then? Antiderivative again, right? So you go, the position of this will be, all right, so what's the antiderivative of t to the first power? The negative 32, let's cover it up. You got it, so you're going you're gonna to add 1 to that, so t squared. You're going to have to scale by a 1 half in front. So that hits the negative 32 and becomes negative 16. t squared. What's the antiderivative of a constant? The constant time, times t. So plus v naught t, right? That was just a number. I don't know what it is. But because I'm taking the antiderivative, again, I have another constant, right? Plus c. And is that a different type of 
so what about this C? What if, what if time was zero? What is D of zero? C. Nothing, nothing. And wouldn't that D of zero mean where I was at time zero? Yeah. So I replaced that C with D sub zero. And that's my initial position. So if D of zero is negative, uh, sorry, is just C, then I can call C D naught. And that gives me this final formula for the position of any object on Earth under the influence of gravity. And I know in my college algebra classes, I show them this, and we work with that formula. Has anyone seen that formula before? Or if in a physics class or something? Falling objects on Earth all follow this quadratic. Okay, yeah, different, maybe a different notation. So it's actually pretty amazing. If you, if you have an object falling on Earth, right, you just tell me where it was when it was let go, and you let me know if it had any, any initial velocity, and I can tell you exactly where it is at every point in time. And all I needed to do that was to know the acceleration of gravity. Right? The antiderivative allows us to recover position functions from acceleration functions. This would work for any planet. As long as you knew the acceleration of gravity, you could find it, the position an object would be at any point in time under the influence of that gravity. The only thing that would change is that negative 32 in the beginning. If you're on the moon, it's not negative 32. I think on the moon it's about a third of that or something, or a sixth of that or something. I forget. If you're on Jupiter, well, you're dead because the gravitational <laughs> pull is probably too much to survive. But anyways, you get the idea, right? I don't know if that kind of helped. That's just one little piece of what an antiderivative could do for you. All right, um, I wanted to now give you some more notation. We got about 20 minutes. Some notation. It gets to be a really a pain in the butt to sit here and over and over tell you, hey, find the antiderivative of this. Find the antiderivative of this. Find the antiderivative of this. There's got to be like a shorthand notation for me to tell you how to do that, right? To, to tell you to do that, right? So here's a notation. If I want you to find the antiderivative of little f, I will write this. Okay, now this symbol right here, look at it as being an s that's been stretched out. So it's like this. All right, it's a stretched out S. That's, That's called the integral sign. Okay, this is called the integral sign. It's a stretched out S for a reason that I have not talked about and I'm not sure I will be able to talk about too much because we only meet, what, twice more? Um, the stretched out comes from the fact that somehow, some way, this antiderivative is going to represent the area underneath the curve. And to find the area under the curve, we're going to add up a bunch of different things. And to add them up means you have to sum them up. And to sum them up, you need a summation. And the Greek symbol for sum is this. Anyway, it's a long story that I don't have time to talk about right now. I will, I will address it later. For right now, I just want to get some notation down. So that's your integral sign. And then you have this thing that you have to attach to the end of this. And for right now, I just want you to write it. And the, dot, the dot's usually not written, OK? But I want you to understand that is multiplication. That right there, dx at the end, is called the differential. And it is critical in where you're headed in Cal 2 to understand what that differential is. But for now, we're going to ignore it, all right? That's, that's how I would write, I, that's how I would tell you I want you to find the antiderivative of little f. That's the notation I would use. So for an example of this, if I say, if I write this down, you are going to say that this is equal to ln x 
plus C. That's what you're going to tell me. If I write this down, you are going to put sine x plus c, right? If I say this, you are going to put cubed plus C. The one-third kills off the three in the front. Are y'all getting this? It's just another way, so I don't have to write down the words, find the antiderivative of. That's all it is. It's a shorthand, that's what I said. It's a shorthand. Notation. It's just notation. Pardon? Oh yeah, you're going to see this for a long time now. Yes, it's just a notation, exactly. It turns out that the integral is a limit, but that's, again, we, 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 right now it's just a symbol, but it comes from, it actually comes from a limit. Yes? So can you make the dx like a, like an actual number? Yes, in fact, that dx is critical. For, for right now, all I want you to do is just Look at the fact that this dx kind of keeps track of what your variable is in the problem. Right now the variable is x, right? There's a dx out there, that means there's... We're, we're finding the antiderivative with respect to x. Remember when we took derivatives and it was with respect to what? We have to worry about that also here. Yeah. That's right. With the respect does come into play, and we need a way of having the notation. So it's uh, a form of like almost Leibniz notation? Yes. Kind of, yes. Actually, that is Leibniz notation. The dx? Without the bottom part. Without the bottom. It's there. Don't worry. It's there. Just <laughs> hang tight. It's there. It's there. All right, so I, I want to motivate the last example that we're going to do here by, we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to start with the function, we're going to take its derivative, get the answer, and then I'm going to ask you for the antiderivative. So we're going to, does that make sense? We're going to cheat. So let's everyone, let's take this function capital F and let's do arctangent of x cubed. All right? I want us to find the derivative of this first. Find F prime. Find capital F prime. So we're taking a derivative, right? What's the derivative of arctangent of something? One over that, one plus that, something squared, times derivative of what's inside? 3x squared. And if I clean that up, this is 3x squared over 1 plus x to the sixth. Agreed? You know, we have to leave it like that. Do you all agree with that? All right. Now, let's start the problem. Find the antiderivative of that. What should our answer be? Our tangent of x cubed plus c. Is, should be our answer, right? How are we going to get to that from here? This is what makes Cal 2 difficult. Do you understand? I'm, I'm trying to undo a chain rule. We know this is a chain rule, right, to get from here to here? I'm trying to undo a chain rule. How do you mean? Have that one, uh, one over one plus x to the sixth, and try to figure it out that way. 
You can't split it if there's, if there's two terms in the bottom and one on top, you cannot split. You can only split if it's two on top, one on the bottom. Okay, so you ready? I'm gonna help you. This is the first one, all right, the first example. You could pull the three out. You could pull the three out. Now, I almost gave you the problem without the three because I wanted to see what you would do, but I wanna go slow here. You can't do anything algebra, okay, you cannot pull the x squared out. That is, I'm glad you asked, you cannot do that. Okay, so look, I'm gonna show you how this needs to be done. You have to recognize that three x squared is the derivative of x cubed. And you have to recognize that this is x cubed squared. You have to see that. You have to see it. You have to be comfortable enough to see that. So the step, what we're gonna do to, to solve this problem is something called substitution. It's the first technique that we learn to try and do these antiderivatives. It's called substitution. And the step goes like this. Try and see something and its derivative in the problem. Do you see something and its derivative? And for this one, you have to squint. You have to, you know, have to squint a little bit, don't you? Okay, but for like most of them, they'll only see x to the third, so can we go from there? You only what? We, like most people would only see x to the third, like the top one. I don't know if they would see something at the bottom. I know I would get like oh, well, points. welcome to Cal 2. You have to see it on the bottom, too. That's, I'm, I'm just, I'm being real with you. I'm being real with you here. I don't want to try and sugarcoat this, all right? This is what it is. You have to be able to undo the processes of, of derivatives. Now maybe I'm, I'm chewing a little bit more here than I should be with this being our first like substitution problem. But that's why I worked it out first. I wanted you to see where we came from, where we came from and let's try and work our way back. So, Yeah, let me just go back to that, okay? So if, I, if I'm sitting there as a Cal 2 student and I recognize that x to the sixth is x cubed squared, then I'm seeing something and its derivative. Do you see it? Something and its derivative. Did you have a question? I was gonna ask, is it, is it okay to just like, I mean, if you looked at that and saw the, you know, the tangent, the tangent arc on it, can you just pull that out and it, and it start getting the ribs from here and that's from there? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, like, so Uh -huh. You can see in there that 1 over uh, 1 plus x squared would fit into that equation. Mm -hmm. You pull that out and then separate your 3x squared. No, you cannot. Oh. I, I think what you're saying is this. Can you look at this as being like the 3x squared is its own thing, and 1 over 1 plus, and then realize that that's like x cubed squared, and then say like the antiderivative of this and the antiderivative of this separately. No, for the same reason that when you take a product and take the derivative, you can't do that. Right? Well, you can't anti-derivative, you can't do anti-derivative that way either, unfortunately. The Cal 2 would be a lot, hard, a lot easier, and Cal 1 would be a lot easier if there wasn't a product rule and a quotient rule and a chain rule. But unfortunately, it is. Oh yeah, this has to be here the whole time. This can't go away just until like you, yep, That's just like the limit. Okay, you ready? I, I really am almost out of time. I want to make sure that you see what I'm about to do, all right? This is, this is called substitution, and this is what we're going to spend a lot of next class on, all right? Substitution. I look here, and I finally have kind of massaged the problem into the point where I see something and its derivative, okay? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a substitution. I'm going to just replace... Everywhere in the problem I see x cubed, I'm going to replace it with u. This is called u substitution. All right? Can we do that? Now, before we actually go and replace it, right, which I'm just about to go and replace that with u right there, I'm just going to ask you right now, what's the derivative of u with respect to x? So I'm taking the left side of this, derivative with respect to x. What's derivative of this with respect to x? 3x squared. Y'all still there? I'm going to do one additional piece to this. I'm going to 
multiply both sides by dx, by the differential dx. And this would be du is 3x squared dx. Y'all still follow that part? Okay. This is the standard technique for substitution. You make your substitution, you differentiate both sides with respect to whatever the variable is. In this case, it's x. And I get this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this, this thing. All right? I'm going to rewrite the whole thing in terms of u. Okay? In terms of u. So I'm going to replace this right here with what? u. Do you see 3x squared dx? Do you see it right here? Do you see that? Because this is multiplication, so that dx could have been on top there. Do you see 3x squared dx? You see it right there? That whole thing gets replaced with what? Du. du. All right? So my new problem becomes this. Integral. This whole thing right here got replaced with what? Du. Over, what's this now? 1 plus u squared. Yeah? Do you all see that? I'm going to rewrite it just a little bit different now. I'm going to put 1 plus 1 over u squared, and I'm going to slap the du on the outside like that. What is the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus u squared? Arctangent of? Just u, right? Our tangent of u. So this, I want to move this up here. So this becomes no more integral sign. The arc tangent of u, right? Plus c, because we took the antiderivative. And that's our answer. But what was u? x cubed. Right? So this becomes arctangent of x cubed plus c. And that's what we knew it was supposed to be, right? We didn't do, we just left the du behind. We just did it together with this. du was used in the problem, but when you take the antiderivative, this is one way you can look at it. When you actually find the antiderivative of that, that goes away, that goes away, and plus c appears, okay? Do you see issues? Do you see that this could become pretty complicated? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, that, that's... But it's, it's all about how comfortable you are with the derivative. If the derivative is something you're comfortable with, it makes going backwards a little easier. There's a famous, uh, not a famous, but there's a, uh, I don't know if it's this textbook, it's a, a textbook I've taught out of in the past, where they, when you get to the, the section on antiderivative, it says, hey, ba basically, like, welcome to Cal 2. Cal 1 was all about, here's a formula, apply the formula, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, right? Here you go, do this, do that, do that. And most people can pick it up after a while. Yes, we make mistakes with product rule, we forget things, quotient rule, we'll forget a negative. We'll forget to square something, whatever. That happens, but it's very mechanical. And then it would say something like, but in Cal 2, it's intuitive. I mean, it's, it's something you just have to have an, an intuition for, and it's difficult to teach that. I can show you how to do substitution. I can't show you how to see things, though. You either see them or you don't. You know what I'm saying? What? Yeah, it's, it's, you're recognizing something. But see, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with the idea that the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, which to me that's obvious, but this is also a pretty basic problem. You, if you're not comfortable with that in your head, it's going to be hard to pick up on the patterns if you don't know what the derivatives are. Um, okay, uh, we are just about out of time. I believe there's some notes in here, though, with some more language that I can just throw up here. Where is it? I didn't put it on here.
next week's the last week we meet, right? Yeah, the, we do not meet on Thursday, obviously. Um, and then next week we meet Tuesday and Thursday, and then we have our final. So my plan is next week to do more of this antiderivative stuff. And my main point of doing this is so that you have exposure to it. When I start my Cal 2 classes, I assume pretty much that you have not seen antiderivatives. Because I know some people just don't get to them. But there will be some people in there that, have, that did you know, two weeks on antiderivatives. So it's just going to depend the people who are in the class. The process of finding, you don't need to write this down, antiderivatives is called integration. What was the process of finding a derivative called? Differentiation. The opposite procedure is called integration. Yes? Your quiz next Tuesday is on optimization. It's going to be very similar to one of the problems in the homework. Yep. It's, the quiz is one problem. Yeah, it's only one problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um. OK. Do your optimization homework. That's your homework for the weekend. Have a great holiday, everyone. Shut this down here.